We'll introduce everyone before their presentations. Today, we're going to try to do two things. We're trying to unpack the problem, keep finding key patterns of illicit flows in the Americas and into the US, followed by identifying a couple big ideas, medium ideas, about what the US could do better without changing a single law. I should tell you, trying to pass a single law in this country is very hard. I've learned that the hard way in the past three years. So this is really exciting for me to uh, interrogate with this fabulous group of panelists, all superstars. Um, so let's start with the inspiration for this, Jason Book, who wrote the um, series for the Texas Observer, Follow the Money. He's going to talk about that story. And uh, we're going to have, again, the first session, the first part of the session will be unpacking the problem. The second part of the session will be what are the, some of the big or medium-sized ideas for how the U.S. could tackle this problem better, again, without changing a single law. I will. You can speak from there or stand up here. I'll, I'll speak from here if that's all right. Uh, yes. Next uh, slide deck, please. The slide deck number one. They said this would work. I'll start talking and hopefully it'll pop up behind me while I talk. There you go. There we go. All right. So Follow the Money is basically the story of two Department of Justice investigations, Operation Green Tide and Operation Politico Junction that targeted uh, state and municipal level officials from Mexico who were laundering in through Texas banks and real estate uh, the proceeds of bribery, theft of public funds, um, various um, crimes that were committed in Mexico and financial transactions in the U.S. Uh, if we can get the, the next slide. Uh, it's, it's told through a guy named Luis, or in part through a guy named Luis Carlos Castillo Cervantes, who they call El Dragón. Uh, he had the exclusive rights to sell and lease a certain kind of a paving equipment in Mexico. Um, and the paving equipment would rip up asphalt and melt it and lay it back down and there was a lot of smoke and fire so the pieces of equipment were called dragons and he was the king of the dragons or the dragon um, and um, that's the exterior of his very nice house in Mission, Texas. So he was paying kickbacks to state and municipal level officials um, and they wanted to move the money, the bribe money that he was paying him into the US to invest it and he owned uh, part of a like regional bank in Texas. And so he was able to use his position within the bank to bring them on board as customers of the bank. And then he would start paying the bribes for the road, contra road paving contracts in Mexico directly from his account at that Texas bank to their account at that Texas bank. These are politically exposed persons and so this brings them under less scrutiny. He also helped a... Um, I guess what you'd call a professional money launderer set up business at the bank. And when this guy had business interests on both sides of the border, and so what he would do is if you had pesos in Mexico that you wanted to invest in something like real estate in the US, he would take a percentage of it. You could give him your pesos in Mexico and he would turn them into dollars in the US. It wasn't particularly subtle. There were, um, he would just transfer the money in, but because he wasn't a pep, um, he managed to go without scrutiny for quite some time. Um, Castillo would, um, was a, a pretty um, regular contributor to local politicians and to state and national politicians. About half of that 27000 that he gave went to Rick Perry, the former um, energy secretary and governor of Texas. He actually hosted a Perry campaign event at that building that was sort of like a um, border governor's conference. And in fact, some of the people that were imp later implicated in the bribery and kickback scheme were present at that event. Um, and he admitted to helping uh, Mexican officials launder $5 million uh, in bribery through um, US banks and real estate. If we can get the next slide, please. So that's some basic info about what um, what the U.S. alleged, or what assets the U.S. alleged were involved in this. Y you know, it's not like huge amounts of money. It's not um, like the Malaysian Development Bank. But it's real, it's real bread and butter corruption and kleptocracy, and it shows that even these low levels of government, the people who are making money on this, want to get it out of their home country and into the world financial system. Um, I, if we go back really quick, um, I wanted to point out who, I think for our purposes today, this will be interesting, who did these investigations? So 
Normally, these types of investigations where you have sort of a complex money laundering scheme that's the proceeds of a crime committed abroad, there's a handful of jurisdictions that do those cases. Um, the regional U.S. attorney's offices in New York and Florida do a lot of those cases, and then there's a centralized Justice Department division that does a lot of cases like that. What was unusual about these cases is they were being prosecuted by the regional U.S. attorney's offices in Texas and by elected local prosecutors, the, the district attorneys who are tasked with enforcing uh, Texas state laws. Um, and I'll come back to that when we talk about solutions. If we can get the, uh, the next slide, please. Oh, and I guess I do want to add about the, that. Those cases went from 2012 to 2018, and then in 2018, they just sort of started to fall apart. A number of the indictments were dismissed. Um, um, asset forfeiture lawsuits were settled under seal, so we don't actually know what happened with those lawsuits. No new such cases have been filed by the U.S. attorneys in those jurisdictions, and in a little bit we'll talk about why we think there's still cases like that going on. So sorry. Now we can go to Javier Villarreal. Um, that he was the form, he was the uh, finance secretary of the state of Coahuila, and that quote is uh, from his testimony in court after his arrest. Uh, when he was asked about the bank uh, officials that he was working with in the U.S. Um, so when I was putting together part one and telling this sort of narrative story, I realized that I could see a timeline of bank transactions and when banks conducted their own, like, know your customer looks at, at people like Javier Villarreal. And what it showed, seemed to show was as long as the banks were getting any kind of answer, when they would ask someone about where they got their money, as long as that person gave them some answer, no matter how preposterous, and if you can read those, there are some somewhat preposterous explanations for where he was getting this money. And even when they knew he was lying or, expect, or suspected he was lying, they continued to do business with him and really faced no consequences. If someone didn't respond to their inquiries, which his former boss didn't, they would get deplatformed. But as long as he kept giving some explanation, they were willing to keep working with him. Uh, if we can get the next slide, please. Uh, so those are the basic findings. Um, the banks that did get dinged were regional banks who didn't issue SARS, uh, so who didn't issue, issue suspicious activity reports that were required by their own internal protocols. So they got fined by US regulators. We can kind of guess that the banks that didn't get fined were issuing SARS, and that's why the government even knew about the timeline, the events of that timeline that I just showed you. We're sort of extrapolating from that, but um, it's, it would appear that as long as the big banks were, were asking the question and then issuing a SAR, they face no consequences. Um, and then if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, part Three was looking at the uh, real U.S. real estate regulations about money laundering. So in the middle of all this, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network found out about these investigations, realized that there was all this money laundering going on in Texas, and so they issued a geographical targeting order for Bear County, Texas, which is where San Antonio is. It basically said that certain financial or certain real estate transactions in this region need to be reported to by the, the title companies. It's a very simplistic way of putting it. Um, so I stole an analysis that Lakshmi did for uh, GFI, and um, I just looked at, okay, so X number of pieces of real estate were subject of this investigation. How many of those were actually covered by the GTO that was prompted by this investigation? Not that many. Uh, part of it was the limited geography of the GTO. Um, they left out Houston, which is a major money laundering hub, including for people from Venezuela. Um, and it left out the Rio Grande Valley. It left out the whole border region, which is a big region for money laundering for people from Mexico. Officials just, you know, move across the border to a sister city. Um, and um, the other one was that the commercial real estate, which in Bear County would, took up the, was the mass, vast majority of the value of the real estate and the thing that presumably would be most likely to raise flags because the residential real estate wasn't that valuable, um, was not covered by it. And there's some proposed regulations right now that, that could change that, that would be more uniform. Uh, if you ask me anything about it later, I will defer to Lakshmi. She knows a lot more <laughs> about it than me. Um, and the next slide, please. So. 
the final piece was just about how some of these government entities in Mexico have started coming to the US, hiring like personal injury lawyers to file fraud claims in state district court, asking a judge to retitle assets that they say were purchased with money stolen from them. I think for what we are gonna talk about today, the most important thing that this shows us is this is a going concern. Green Tide and Politico Junction didn't stop this. Mexican government entities are continuing to come to the U.S. and say that they were defrauded by former officials and not a lot is being done about it by the Justice Department. Um, this was cut from the story, but I'll end with this little anecdote. Um, there is the former governor of Chihuahua, his name is Cesar Duarte, he's in Florida, he's in U.S. custody, he's charged in Mexico. The U.S. government, pursuant to an extradition request, is going to court in the Southern District of Florida and saying, Mr. Duarte, you know, committed X, Y, and Z crime, and so he should be sent to Mexico to face these, to, to face charges for these crimes. The state of Chihuahua claims that they have uncovered real estate that he purchased with that stolen money in Florida, in Texas, and in New Mexico, and no one from the U.S. Attorney's Office in those jurisdictions is going out there and doing anything to try to seize the property like they had during Green Tide and Politico Junction, even though they're in court making the exact same argument that the state of Chihuahua is making uh, pursuant to their obligations under the extradition treaty. Thank you, Jason. Um, because you've been very uh, good about keeping time, I'm actually going to take one or two questions now. We're going to. The plan is to do a round of questions at the end, but um, happy to take one or two. I have a question, which is, why did those investigations stop in 2019? Do we know? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it's really hard to say that obviously the administration changed in 2017. Um, the, the Trump administration's priorities, the priorities of the new U.S. attorneys were very different than the previous administration's priorities. Um, there's, I, I could go on a while about the immigration issue, but I mean, you had the deputy attorney general calling the U.S. attorney in San Antonio to yell at him for having dismissed five misdemeanor cases when they were doing the family separation policy. And I can't imagine that there's ever in the history of um, the Justice Department been a situation where the Deputy Attorney General was calling to yell about one half of a percent of the misdemeanors that were filed that day or were referred for prosecution that day. So certainly there was a change in focus and I think these offices were very hyper-focused on certain things that the new administration wanted. Also, people just moved on to new jobs and there was no system in place to move somebody in to like replace them who had this kind of specialized knowledge. So like one of the lead prosecutors became a US magistrate judge. In her cases, she basically dismissed them right before she became a magistrate judge. And I just don't think there was anyone in place to, to take over for her. One of the lead agents went to, a, um, went to a posting abroad and there was nobody really to carry the torch for her. Thank you. I can take one question. Please go ahead. Um, do we have someone with a mic? I can repeat it back. Yeah, I Talk can, real I can, loud. That works for us. And introduce yourself, please. Yeah, they were the majority owner of the bank. The, the Castillo owned like 7% and Banorte was the majority owner. And they were, Banorte was who ended up facing the fine um, be, as the majority owner. Which is fascinating given the connections of high level street politicians to Banorte and the ownership structure and the history of all that. Okay, yes. uh, I just wanted to make sure I was connecting yes. those dots. Yes. I have a general question tied to that, which is, what kind of customer due diligence is there for people who just buy a bank? I mean, FTX bought a bank. I don't know if I got into that in this story. I can tell you that I believe it was the same person we were ref maybe referring to in Benorte had purchased a Texas bank back in like the 80s through nominee owners and had to face a pretty significant fine, or maybe the 90s through nominee owners and had to ta face a, a pretty significant fine. Um, for not disclosing the fact that he was the actual owner. And the current chairman of Banorte was sitting by the Fed and wasn't allowed to sit on any board that had to do with the United States. I mean, it was a specific effort to purchase regional banks on the board of the Fed. 
Yeah, I don't know if, if anybody didn't hear that, but yes, the, pre, the, the is it the current chair? Anyway, I, I, yeah, I don't have that at my fingertips, but an but important figure within Benorte was, was fined by the U.S. government back in the 90s for, for this, basically purchasing community banks in Texas through nominee owners. Um, so there was some due diligence that was supposed to be done, and they were trying to avoid it. Thank you. Um, before we move on to our next speaker, I just want to point out that um, U.S. representatives have formed something called um, the Countering Kleptocracy Caucus. I think it's that's more or less what it's called. And there's something about 35, maybe 40 uh, representatives, only one from Texas, and that is... Who wouldn't comment for this story. Who would not comment for this story. Um, it's really been striking how little uh, concern and attention on this issue um, is paid by uh, members of Congress and from Texas. I'm from Texas, I can say that, half Texan. Okay, thank you, Jason, and we will have a another round of conversations with the ideas about um, what next. Um, ready to go to our second presentation with David Luna. Very honored that David uh, agreed to speak today. David has been one of the sort of chief architects behind many very smart policies around tackling national um, in transnational crime and illicit networks. Uh, before he f founded and is now executive director of the International Coalition Against Illicit economy, Economies, ICAIA, he was for more than 20 years uh, holding senior positions in the US government um, including directorships for national security, transnational crime, and anti-corruption. And since I got into this business has been a really like a point person for critical thinking in this area. So very excited to have David speak. Would you like to speak standing or sitting? It doesn't matter. Great. I'll let you stay there. Great. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Zoe. Um, it is a pleasure to be here uh, with this distinguished panel, um, really uh, bright people who have been working on various cross-border threats, um, including corruption and organized crime. Thank you, Zoe, for your leadership as well. Over the years, um, with the um, Anti-Corruption Data Collective, and Jason, thank you for your uh, research, I think. When we think about these multi-dimensional threats, it does require a multidisciplinary um, approach and a whole of society. So it is great that we have investigative journalists doing you know, this amazing work because it's that evidence-based research um, by journalists and, and academia as well. I see Dr. Shelley up here in the front. I'm also the co-director for the anti illicit Trade Institute at TRAC at George Mason University. It really helps to inform the international community on the harms and scale of today's um, illegal economy and I was asked uh, to speak about our recent report on the dark side of illicit economies and trade-based money laundering, free trade zones, ports, and financial safe havens. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, you know, really tackling um, the, the global illicit environment requires really collective action. Um, yes, we talk about legislative authorities. It's great that Jake Sullivan announced the commitment of the White House and the President on the Enablers Act. But really, there's other tools at our disposal that we need to be doing more. Not only the evidence-based work that I just mentioned, but really the information sharing across borders, across sectors, across regions. Because you can see, um, the, yeah, the next, uh, this slide, uh, the magnitude of, of, of how much illicit wealth there is around the world. If we were to really um, put in the basket all of the various criminal, criminal activities and illicit markets, the global illegal legal trade would be essentially the fourth uh, largest GDP uh, economy in the world. Um, next slide. So this is why, you know, when we look at illicit trafficking, flows, illicit financial flows, it is important um, to really work together to collect the dots so that we can really enhance the disruption, enhance the dismantling of various criminal networks. They're, they're complicit corrupt officials, the enablers, um, but also uh, those who are obviously laundering uh, the dirty money um, next. 
So I, I talk a, a little bit about um, really strategic intelligence and you know, oftentimes I think civil society really has some of the best intelligence um, in specific markets in a very dangerous um, environment as well. I mean, many um, journalists, uh, many NGOs are constantly facing threats and uh, if not being assassinated uh, for really exposing um, corruption and criminality around the world um, next. So as part of ICAIA, and, and let me just underscore that ICAIA is, is a fairly new national security centric NGO based in, 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 in Washington DC and bringing together champions um, and doers who are committed to counter corruption, counter organized crime, counter terrorism, but really it's the convergence. And you know, I think one of the best ways that we can really combat a lot of these bad actors and threat networks is by leveraging, by leveraging the expertise, leveraging the information, um, not only within governments, and sometimes some of the governments are part of the problem, uh, but across sectors so that we can pinpoint um, some of the specific uh, actors, some of the specific illicit nodes to surface, to surface um, the criminals and to begin uh, to work together to, um, again, um, identify the dirty money and seize that dirty money. And um, part, next slide, part of our work um, examine this cross-border illicit trade um, and, and really s who are emerging as some of the bad actors. It's not only the cartels and the gangs. China, in fact, um, I, I will say uh, CCP Inc., the Communist Party, and, um, is really fueling a lot of the illicit trade, not only in the hemisphere, and, um, but more globally, especially through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we have identified about 34 uh, 37 ports um, in which China, the CCP, um, in, 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 in concert with other criminal actors, have either control or um, have um, some um, corruptive influence in a lot of these um, ports um, in which uh, some of the bad actors um, are able to traffic um, in, in fentanyl or precursors, in counterfeits, in human trafficking, in personal protective equipment, uh, fake medicines, you name it. Once they have this infrastructure, it really, again, um, empowers um, illicit actors to really ply their trade. And of course, as they're corrupting a lot of these countries, um, and some of these flows um, began to appear in a lot of our countries, um, including in the United States, it becomes a, a bigger harm altogether. Um, so, you know, whether it's narcotics or human trafficking, um, you know, the opioids, um, again, taken together, it really begins to develop um, or really fuel greater insecurity and instability in many parts of the world. Um, next slide. I briefly mentioned uh, the fentanyl crises. Um, again, DEA has done tremendous work, but a lot of um, good research institutions have also begun to connect some of the, some of the um, uh, cross points uh, were, um, you know, some of the uh, illegal fentanyl is coming not only into Mexico and Canada, uh, but as cartels began to um, traffic and smuggle some of that um, um, contraband into the United States. Um, again, it's not only an economic issue, it becomes a public health and safety. Um, it is true that Tens of thousands of Americans are dying every um, year from um, the illicit fentanyl. Um, next slide. Um, I, I got five minutes, so I got to run through a lot of these. But again, here we are at the Inter International Anti-Corruption Conference, and I don't have to talk too much about the harms that corrupt corruption causes, but I do want to underscore that if we were to do overlays, intelligence overlays on some of these um, countries that have higher incidences of corruption, if you were to overlay uh, these you know, uh, countries with the trafficking flows of narcotics, human trafficking, counterfeits, um, even money flows, you begin to identify a bigger panorama that can help 
um, law enforcement and other societies, other communities, to again do greater disruption and dismantling of illicit trade. Um, I will stop here because he asked me not to talk about recommendations until a further discussion. Thank you, Thank you David. Sir. That was great. Um, I we're doing good on time now, but I'm a little worried because I'll have to translate later. So I'm probably going to not ask for questions going right now, except for one, which is my question. Um, can you? One of the things I thought was so striking in your in your report was um, you really sort of identified the role that the illicit flows have in, in fueling um, the funding of terrorist organizations, Hamas, um, Hezbollah, and others. And I'm wondering if that threat is un adequately understood or, or, or not. Um, obviously, you, I, I, in my mind, it is not a widely understood threat. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 look, again, a lot of good um, investigative journalists, a lot of good think tanks here in Washington have done a lot of great work on the involvement of, for example, Hezbollah in the illicit trade and in illicit finance that helps to support um, some of the terrorist uh, uh, network um, globally for Hezbollah and um, obviously Iran. And, uh, but more needs to be done. And, you know, often, oftentimes people don't really have the time to read 100 or 200 page reports that I think we need to be thinking more smartly uh, maybe through documentary, maybe through infographics, but really educating communities on on the harms and impacts of Hezbollah, of the of the, of the cartels, of of, of of other you know criminal uh, syndicates around the world, um, to really understand why it matters and why we should be doing more. Um, so I think um, public um, awareness is very important to really show the extent. Of, of, of the horns being caused by, by Hezbollah and others. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Lakshmi Kumar. I'll ask that the, oh, good, they're already up. Um, what to say about Lakshmi? First of all, she's on the executive committee of the Anti-Corruption Data Collective. Uh, I don't think that's the most important thing she does, but it is the, one of the most important things for us. Lakshmi is the policy director of Global Financial Integrity, and before coming to GFI, she worked with governments and regulatory agencies across South Asia, East Africa, and Eurasia to investigate money laundering and terrorist financing risks. I will say that someone who works closely with Lakshmi, both through ACDC and the FACT Coalition and in other venues, uh, she's really the brains in the place, and she has such a powerful uh, and commanding knowledge that she imparts generously to all of us and patiently. Um, and for that, we are grateful. And so I look forward to her presentation. And she will stand and give me a few minutes on my, off my feet. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I have been sitting at several meetings today. And so I, I really do welcome the opportunity to stand and um, for the very, very generous, generous introduction that um, Zoe made. I think when we try to think about the issue of illicit financial flows and money laundering, I think we often forget that it's not just about the money. The, very often the way money moves is deeply a product of history, geography, cultural context. And in that, I think when we start thinking about the relationship between US, the Latin America, and the Caribbean, you see that you know because the, there is such this proximate relationship or geography, culturally, Politically, U.S. policies or the lack of U.S. policies tend to have an outsized impact on the region. And one of the things that we started to look at a couple of years ago is because we were concerned about, as Jason mentioned, about the real gaps in the U.S. regulatory framework on real estate and were desperate to fi find and fix those gaps. And so we studied five years worth of cases and what we were incredibly surprised about is that because of the gaps on the US side, we were essentially enabling corrupt, illicit money from all over the world to find a safe haven here. We could track money. 82% of the cases we found were from outside the US. We could track them to 26 countries. And this is where history, geography, and context really matter. Because what we saw in the US was that 
54% of those cases came from the Latin American Caribbean region. And that's a sizable number. And when we looked at the same thing in the UK, in Canada, you saw, for instance, the UK had a lot of South Asian money coming in from India and Pakistan, which makes sense given the cultural context. You did not see money from the Latin American region go to the UK, go to Canada, but you saw all of it come to the US. And so it really tells us when we start thinking about how to solve the problem, it is very much not about what's going on in Latin America, it's equally about what's going on in the US. Um, Additionally to that, and I will just, before we go on to the next slide, you can see that the top foreign origins were Mexico, Guatemala, and Venezuela. And a lot of Venezuelan money started coming into the US. We could also see the cases crop up right around the sanctions. And if you look at politically exposed persons, for those of you that are familiar, I won't explain it, but if you're not, it is a very fancy way of saying if you're a high-level politician or you are an associated family member or connection, that is a politically exposed person. And even then, you look at the top five countries, they're all from within the region. And so what the next thing for us, the next research project after this, was there was an FBI alert that came out in 2019, which said with high confidence that US private investment funds are at a high risk for money laundering. For those of you that are familiar, I won't explain it, but for some of you that may not be, private investment funds is a way of describing private equity, venture capital funds, you know, everything that goes into making, I suppose, Uber what Uber is today. Um, you also have other categories of sort of wealth managers, family offices. This is another way of saying, essentially, if you are not a high net worth person, but a very, very, very Jeff Bezos level rich person, you set up your own personal private equity fund and invest all over the world. And essentially what this was able to show, the FBI leak, it was a leaked alert, it showed that Mexican drug cartels were using this, and we think of drug cartels doing, oh, they do bulk cash smuggling, they carry crash or cash over the border, they're investing in gold, they're investing in sometimes sex trafficking, but none of us think of drug cartels as sophisticated players in the capital markets. And that's what this leak showed, is that money launderers are more sophisticated businessmen than Fortune 500 companies. They think about the long-term horizons. They are not just looking to turn dirty money into white money. They are thinking about how do I build money for generations. And so the question then was, okay, we've under, we're thinking about the US context, but because of this proximate geographic cultural relationship to the Latin American and Caribbean region, what does that relationship look like? And if we go to the next slide. And the one thing we found is the US sector, for instance, is $11 trillion private investment fund market. It's $11 trillion. That is twice the GDP of the Latin American and Caribbean region. This entire pool of money in the US is unregulated for money laundering, completely unregulated. By contrast, the Latin American region is about $85.6 billion, is how much it's worth, with Mexico and Brazil contributing the largest chunk at about 57.3 billion. Now, some of the reasons why the investment market in Latin America and the Caribbean have not grown at the same level is because you know there were some risks around corruption, economic stability, there are various risks that have prevented the growth of the markets that it should be. And the question is, why is all of this relevant? So what we've really seen that seems to have happened is that when we start looking at this, there are interesting developments. So let's take the case of Brazil, which is arguably the largest in the region economically. 84% of the Brazilian private equity market today is controlled by family offices within Brazil. Go back to about the 1990s, that bulk of that money was coming from foreign investment firms. Now when I say, I'm not saying one is better regulated, but it tells you that a lot of the money now that's floating around in Brazil is essentially money that's of very wealthy businessmen who, and there is a very high risk that they've all been previously implicated, given the sort of what we've seen the news that has come out of Brazil in corruption scandal. So that tells you what we're getting. At the same time, we have seen a lot of Brazilian family offices, 105 of them set up at Miami in a trading desk. And they're also then for investing in the US. So when you talk about the problem of private equity and venture capital, what we're not realizing there is there are a lot of sophisticated players. And there are two cases. So this is the Pedavesa money laundering scam. It was a billion dollars that was lost out of um, Pedavesa. And I, I realize I'm short on time, so I'm gonna run through this now. Um, but 
essentially um, what we were able to see through this, the scam, because no one talked about the investment fund portion of it, is it started in Venezuela, moved through the US, sometimes they set up fake investment funds because it meant that you wouldn't have AML scrutiny. But ultimately you had investment bankers from Malta, Antigua, spread Venezuelan money all across the world into real estate, a whole host of companies, but the vehicle they used was an investment fund. And investment funds don't have AML regulation in most places in the world, especially in the US, and even when they do, they're unenforced. Um, next slide. And what we're really seeing, at least in the Latin American context that I want to get to is that, and I think it's important from a recommendation standpoint, is the risk to a minor degree appears domestic, but the bigger degree is because there's such a large amount of money floating in the region, it's all going outside. It is going to private investment funds, but based in the US, based in Europe, based in Canada. And this one is, a, is an example of something that was in the FBI alert. And it essentially talked about a drug cartel laundering money through US real estate investment. And if you can go to the next slide, you can see that that money went into buying properties, the Hilton Hotel, the Western Hotel, right here in DC next door. So I would like you to, the recommendation is to think about, think about these sophisticated investment vehicles because money launderers are smart and we should be just as smart. I personally think Lakshmi is smarter. Um, so Lakshmi is gonna have to leave at 6.10, so I'm really hoping we can get to um, the discussion of like best ideas of going forward, but um, it's great to have that highlight and I will make sure that at six we stop to have at least the initial discussion before you have to go. So our next speaker is Jose Ugas. I honestly don't know how to introduce Jose. He's absolutely one of my number one anti-corruption heroes. He, um, I think he would hate me for saying this, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. Um, this is the guy who brought down Fujimori and Montesinos, sure, that guy. Um, but he's also one of the most passionate, thoughtful, and committed anti-corruption activists I know who spends all of his time working in support of many of the chapters, two of which he is on the board of, Proetica, TI Peru, and the Ukraine chapter, and he's been just a real um, ally and force for good in the Americas and probably knows, you know, I would love to, to have more time for each of these panelists to speak, but um, I will pass it over to you. Do you want to sit or stand? Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Zoe, uh, for the invitation to participate in this panel. Uh, corruption and grand corruption that has been one of our main concerns in Transparency International in the last decade and a half is basically about greed and money. As a matter of fact, tomorrow we are having a workshop at 3.30 3 uh, on grand corruption, and I think it's, it's an interesting point where we have arrived after all these years of dealing with the matter. So when we talk about grand corruption, we are basically talking about a crime of power, de facto power from economical groups or political power. And uh, because it's a crime of power, it mobilizes amazing amounts of money. We just heard uh, the case of PDVSA in Venezuela. Merchi is going to talk about it. But when you see the amounts of money, the billions of billions of dollars that have been taken by the corrupt network of Chavez and Del Maduro, those numbers are ridiculous. In thousands and thousands of millions of dollars going all around the world. Uh, so money laundering is, is a very important uh, uh, and a key part of the chain, and that's why it's, it's always necessary to be reviewing how the authorities and, and uh, the anti-corruption community tries to deal with these new and renewed constantly mechanisms for laundering money. So uh, in this case, I would like to compare a traditional case of laundering that is uh, on the head of probably the largest case of corruption, the largest scheme of corruption we have suffered in Latin America is the Lava Jato case that started in Brazil. It's also called Car Wash. And I would like it to compare it to the 
new schemes that are appearing now in most of the countries of Latin America, as it just has been mentioned, related to trade. Because trade is a new way of mobilizing huge amounts of resources and assets, but reducing, uh, taking advantage of the reduced controls and the sophistication of the trade systems that we have right now in the world. So uh, going to the Lava Jato case, next slide please. Uh, the Lava Jato case was uh, known, very well known because the largest company of construction in Brazil, Odebrecht, a huge company, was involved with other 20 companies, very big Brazilian companies, in this uh, scheme of corruption that implied going to the countries of Latin America, 11 countries of Latin America were involved in this scheme, and two countries of Africa. And they went to the top, they got in contact with the governments, that's why so many presidents or former presidents of our countries are involved in this case. Uh, currently, at least 16 former presidents of Latin America have been prosecuted, investigated, some of them convicted, one of them killed himself to avoid uh, the investigation in Peru, uh, other is pending of extradition from the United States. So uh, these companies went to the uh, heads of the countries of Latin America and these two African uh, uh, countries, regions, and they established schemes of bribe payment in order to assure the control of the big investment projects in Latin America. So we were talking here about billions of dollars if we get all the countries together. Just to have an idea, in Brazil it was $2.4 billion, the money that was involved in the scheme. In Peru, my country, $3.5 billion, and then we can go around the other countries. Uh, all this was discovered because it, it, it was a, a small business of car wash, that, that is why it is called a car wash case, the Brazilian police started following some guy that was called a doleiro. This was a person involved in the exchange currency market. And they started following this guy and then they discovered that he was related to Petrobras, who was the huge oil company of Brazil. And then with all these construction companies that at the same time were making works in different countries of Latin America. So, uh, the Lava Jato money laundering scheme is what we would call a traditional scheme. So maybe we can move to the next slide, please. And the next one. And, and a traditional scheme of money laundering involves several pieces. Uh, in the case of this Doleiro, who was the guy making the exchange uh, black market currency in Brazil, he charged commissions to move the proceeds of corruption to different markets out of Brazil. And some of that came, of course, here to the United States. Why, that's why the first memorandum of agreement, the first agreement between Odebrecht and a government happened here in the States with $4 billion uh, of fine that was agreed between the company and the United States government. Uh, in this case, that Doleiro used four companies and one shell company in Bahamas in order to move around $150 million uh, that was invested in real estate vehicles and move through different transference, transferences from bank accounts. And at the same time, on the other side, the companies were doing exactly the same, with the difference that, for example, Odebrecht had a very strong structure and it could mobilize huge amounts of money to the point that they created several offshore companies also in Bahamas. They were with different frontmen in order to uh, mobilize these assets and they even created an apartment within the company that was called the Structure Operations Apartment with accountants, lawyers, uh, specialists in finance, and all these people were there only 24-7 to design the way of mobilizing this money coming from uh, the corrupt contracts they were signing all around the region. Uh, they, in order to avoid 
the situation of money laundering controls, decided to buy a bank. So that can give you an idea of how powerful was Odebrecht. They bought a bank in Antigua. It was an Austrian bank that had a, its headquarters in, in Austria. And uh, this made a lot of facilitation in order to move the assets from Brazil to the different countries to pay the bribes, to collect the money and then take it out in order to secure it in different assets or bank accounts around the world. So uh, this is a typical case of uh, corruption that derives in, in a money laundering scheme. But nowadays, uh, because of the huge amount of trade in, in a global world and the immense amounts of, of money that moves around these trade businesses, the money launderers now are using also trade channels in order to uh, launder their uh, proceeds of corruption and other crimes. And uh, in Peru, we had this case, please, the next slide, was, was called the NTR Metals case because it involved a Peruvian actor with several companies and other people, but on the other side, this money was coming here to the United States and ended in one of the biggest, largest companies of uh, gold in the world, that is uh, Elemetal. So the guy you see there in the picture, his name is Peter Ferrari. That was his nickname, of course. He was a model, uh, but before he went into the world of fashion, he was involved in some drug trafficking activities. He was linked to the cartel of uh, Valle del Norte of Colombia. Why do people like Peter Ferrari, and I will explain in a minute how he did to move these millions of dollars from Peru to the United States, went into the trade of gold business? Basically because trade has more sophisticated channels and are more difficult to detect when you move uh, dirty money from one place to another. Because the goods they usually involve are goods that are difficult to examine or goods with a wide price in margins, like, for example, gold. You can please move to the, to the next uh, slide. So what Peter Ferrari did, you know, in Peru, there's a huge activity of illegal mining involving, I would say, more than a million and a half people. Uh, uh, basically in the Amazon jungle, but also in the south part of the country. And this illegal mining is also linked to many other criminal activities. Of course, it has a huge environmental damage. It has exploitation of children and women uh, <coughs> and uh, different uh, other criminal activities, smuggling and, of course, uh, killings and all the problems that are around a huge operation of illegal mining. Something similar happens in Venezuela, in El Arco Minero, where some of this gold was coming from, too. So uh, that's why I think money launderers now are moving to uh, the, the trade uh, business. So proceeds of criminal activity, like drug trafficking, or illegal mining, or foreign bribery, or illicit smuggling, in this case, went through the business of gold. So uh, the gold was acquired from the illegal miners in Peru, and then through a large mechanism of false documents, it was sent to Bolivia or to Ecuador. Sometimes the gold was coming from Venezuela, and sometimes it was dispatched directly from Peru to the United States through security companies that uh, uh, acquired the gold they had it in their, in their locations, and then it was exported by air to the United States with all these false documents. How do the authorities started following Peter Ferrari? Because he created some companies. He used basically four companies. And one of his companies, in 2012, appeared exporting $73 million. But the next year, in 2030, it went from 73 to $980 million. And between 2030 and 2015, the amount of money exported in gold was $3.6 billion. 
So when the investigation started, what they found is a scheme like the one we are gonna see in the next slide. The guy in the center is Peter Ferrari. Those are the companies on the top that he established in order to uh, appear as a trader in gold. He has several brokers in the middle that were dealing with a relation with the American company, NTR, basically uh, established in Miami. And the headquarters of NTR that belong to Elemental, that is this huge worldwide gold company, is in Texas. So the money was coming from the Amazon uh, region, in, in some cases from Venezuela, in other cases, it arrived to Lima and through these companies and the brokers, at the end, it went through a fake process uh, going through customs and the gold was sent basically to Miami, to a refinery of NTR. And one it, once it was refined in NTR, then it was sent to Texas where finally it uh, finished the chain of the business. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Peter Ferrari, as I mentioned, worked years ago for the cartel of the Valle del Norte, drug trafficker uh, uh, from Colombia. That is the origin of the money. Then he started exporting and he exported uh, 14 tons of gold using these four companies I mentioned before. And one, only one of the three brokers he had to concrete the business between Peru and the United States created at the same time 53 ghost companies that were moving all these bars of gold from Latin America to the United States. So that chain, it was an illegal Peruvian gold moving to Bolivia, Ecuador, or Chile. Then it came to Miami uh, through fake documents to a refinery in Doral in Miami, and then it went finally to the headquarters of Elemental. Uh, it also involved, next slide please, all uh, a large chain of exchange, money exchange companies, and in the next slide you will see some of the bars that Peter Ferrari was sending to the United States. So uh, there are some suggestions. Can, we'll get to the suggestions for, after, for that's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna give, before we go to Merchi, I just wanna, um, because Lakshmi has to leave, I just wanted to underscore her three main points in terms of recommendations going forward, and I think we'll pick them up, as I know, um, after with, uh, once we finish with Merchi. So if you wanna just speak to those three points before you oh, head off. Um, I, I apologize for having to leave. I, I teach a class, and this is the last class of the semester, so I, I cannot abandon people, so I apologize for that. But quickly, sort of the three uh, recommendations are, I think because private investment funds are such sophisticated uh, uh, vehicles, a lot of law enforcement offices, both in Latin America and the U.S., aren't used to thinking about it. You think about the movement of money laundering and very traditional things, and I think it's important for law enforcement to recognize that money laundering is becoming sophisticated. They are moving into sectors like private investment funds, renewable energy, things we don't think about. And so making sure that people in government, law enforcement that is involved in investigations actually is aware of these cases, gets the training, gets access to data is important. Um, I think the other recommendation I said is because there is a proximate relationship, as much as it is on Latin America, it's, it's significantly more on the US, Switzerland, Malta, Cayman Islands, Canada, where you see the export of Latin American capital, whether it's illicit, corrupt, making those countries do adequate assessments, looking to understand their risks so they aren't engendering problems within the region is just as important. And the last thing is very specific to the Brazilian context. I think it's a need to take a look at because of the way business structures operate in the Brazilian context and the risks of corruption, to take a significantly higher look at family offices and the reporting structures that exist at present and sort of raise them so there are better opportunities for transparency and disclosures and also sort of in, uh, thereby reducing corruption risk. So those are my three big recommendations. Thank you, Lakshmi. Thanks very much. So, um, happy to introduce you to Merchi de Freitas, who is the head, the head of the Transparency International chapter in Venezuela, Transparencia Venezuela, which she founded in 2004. Um, how to explain what Merchi has uh, done in Venezuela, where she's been banned from speaking uh, on state 
television. There's absolutely no outlet for much of you know, the work that she does in terms of investigations. But somehow she's been able to use technology in really creative ways to both identify and report on corruption within the country and human rights abuses. And um, I'm just gonna ask her to start speaking. She may, we may do some simultaneous translation. I don't think we need to because her English is actually fabulous. And uh, really looking forward to her presentation. Hello, how are you? Uh, my English is horrible, but I try, okay? Um, and, and, and so, uh, uh, I'm on standby. Help me, okay. Um, next slide. Next, next uh, slide, please. Okay, this is the, the map uh, show the present of the Venezuelan Corruption Network in the work. It's uh, 73 countries in, for, for now. For, for now. Next, please. Um, for now, the, the investigation unit in, in Transparency Venezuela uh, have registered to the 176 uh, case in the system justice, or como se llama? Yeah, uh, court cases. Court cases. In the for uh, attorney or uh, justice or etc. The, the this 141 uh, case is in the 25 countries, different countries. Okay, next please. Next please. Okay, in the United States, they uh, have a uh, five seven. Uh, 57. 57 case alone, uh, 173 indicted, 69 declared guilty, 68 cri uh, criminal sentence, 47 uh, people on the run from the law in Venezuela safe, mm, the, the people is in Venezuela and live uh, with uh, lujo. Yeah, the fugitives from the law are hiding okay. out in Venezuela. And with the government support and um, protect to the government. Uh, the, the amount uh, only for 57 case in the United States is the 20, uh, 26 billion dollars, okay? Uh, uh, but I don't have only information for the, the this case. I have information about the the forty uh, case. The, the amount is very more. It's right. mucho más. This is just what's covered in these cases. It's not the whole. It's not 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 some all. of corruption that. Yes, I I uh, uh, my uh, team don't have um, uh, access on information uh, in all case. And but. Um, I, it's at least it's, it's a job. tip of the it's iceberg. The, the next line, you understand me? Yes? Oh, okay. Okay, the, this month is a, a company's a, a signal identifica, identified in the a, 141 case. No? In this, in this, the, the De esas empresas. So of the 2,244 companies that have been identified? Okay, 295 uh, is in the, in the United States, great in the United States. The next, you understand me, yes. Okay, uh, the, the other, the other, <laughs> the, the other, uh, um, be a um, way to the United States uh, support uh, collaboration with the investigation is uh, again the corrupter is with sanctions and in this moment half a 142 people 
uh, go with assets blocked and business enterprise, empresas, sanctions 107.8. It's a big job. <laughs> and the next, please. Okay, this is a, a, a case study. The, this, this guy is bad guy. <laughs> it's a very bad guy. Um, Nervis Villalobos uh, is a former minister to energy in Venezuela. Uh, electricity and, and, and um, uh, energy. Um, uh, it's a, a special operator to the big uh, network to the grand corruption in Venezuela. He lives uh, in Spain, but the other, the, ah, excuse me, no. The, the, this this uh, graphic uh, is uh, the show to the special, um, uh, technology we have. With the support board, the Fundación Vortex, we have uh, uh, access to the, this uh, technology. Uh, esa, te Ajá, sí. esa tecnología permite eh, mostrar las relaciones entre los corruptos. Yeah. So this is a, a technology that enables them to see the relationships between the different corrupt actors. Okay. And show the, the first uh, direct tie and the second or third uh, connection between be, the, between the agentes or people. The next. Okay. Uh, Nervis Villalobos is investigation in 40 case in, 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 in four countries, United States, Spain, Venezuela, Andorra, and Portugal. The next. He have a direct, uh, he, he stayed he, in, in six uh, business uh, with uh, publicly uh, owned. The next. But he control a 24 uh, business secretary, uh, sec uh, secretary con controller, the 24 uh, business in these countries. Okay, this is the name of, of uh, enterprise or, or business. The next, and his uh, socios and uh, associates of Nervis control secret secretamente. Uh, 18 business more. Uh, the next. Okay. Okay. Aquí tú lo tienes que leer y ya, ¿no? Okay. <laughs> the United States is the country that has more initiative investigation for money laundering crime, uh, in terms from corruption in Venezuela and other for to uh, organize crime in uh, illicit economy, uh, il economias ilicitas incluidas. Uh, 67 convicts of settlement agreement. Lelo tu I think folks can read it. I mean, I think she, what, what Merch is trying to lay out is um, all the, the ways in which the United States currently is uh, supporting uh, through different kinds of it, it, both joint investigations, trainings, and other forms of cooperation um, efforts to uh, help detect and deter and prosecute illicit flows. Um, and these are sort of the key ways in which the U.S. is doing that today. Okay, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Merji. So somehow we're miraculously back on time, and I really want to appreciate Merji for jumping in in English and um, and you know translating these slides at the last minute. We had hoped to have translation, but such is life. Um, I want to, we have 20 minutes, and I really want to give everyone an opportunity to, I, I asked them to say, what are the, like, the one, two, three sort of big ideas, medium ideas, small ideas uh, about what the U.S. could be doing better uh, to tackle illicit flows without changing the law? 
Um, and so probably what I'll do is um, start with Jose, because you uh, were just there with your slide when I, when I cut you off. Um, can we put on Jose Ugas's slide? Uh, in the case of Peter Ferrari, he was uh, uh, detained and then he was re released by a court, probably because he paid some bribe, then he died of COVID. And NTR, the American company that was in the middle of this corrupt scheme, was only sanctioned with $15 million here in the United States. And Elemental was out of the case. So uh, some suggestions that I believe could improve the control of money laundering related to, to trade. Uh, the first, first thing I would say is technology. I mean, the corrupt are really working with high level of technology and sometimes our customs, our authorities are not working with all the uh, means they could have in order to sophisticate the control of this type of activity, uh, artificial intelligence and different other platforms. The other thing is that uh, there is not enough coordination between the authorities that are involved in a case of money laundering related to trade. In this case of Peter Ferrari, for example, and NTR, if the customs would have been talking to the drug trafficking authorities and to the authorities related to illegal mining, the case would have had probably other result in, in Peru but they were not talking to each other. The tax, the tax agency was not talking either to some of these authorities. So I think that there is absolutely need to have a comprehensive approach to the new phenomenon of money laundering related to uh, trade. And the other thing is to understand what we are talking about. These are much more sophisticated schemes, so there's a lot of training and knowledge transfer that is needed if I use uh, will need to improve their skills on trade-based money laundering schemes, and of course, customs should also be more uh, aware of the different ways of uh, how, how this money is being laundered. The relation between predicate offenses uh, <clears throat> with the money laundering schemes is also something that is not being worked, in my opinion, uh, as an integral concept, and that makes all these gaps that are uh, taken advantage from, from the corrupt side. Uh, and finally, related to the Lava Jato case, I would say that there's a need, without changing any law, but I think some guidelines are needed now, for example, uh, in order to uh, avoid the uh, problems that we are having with the Lava Jato case. The agreement in the Lava Jato case between the prosecutors, the Attorney General Office, and the companies now is suspended because many of the evidence as what collected by the prosecutors of the states in relation with the prosecutors of Brazil, Peru, Argentina, or whichever country, were not uh, uh, obtained through formal agreements. They were using WhatsApp, communica informal communications. That was great because in the context of the ANCAC, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, that is what is needed to do. But they, I mean the corrupt, are taking advantage of those things, saying this is informal, this is violating guarantees, and now they have obtained a suspension of the agreement in Brazil. And that is a huge problem, not only for Brazil, but also for the other 10 countries involved in this case. And my final suggestion is that in the case of the United States, that is very uh, uh, keen and fast to arrive to agreements with a corrupt and impose with a SEC, the Security Exchange Commission, huge fines to the corrupt. The problem is that after the agreements are signed, very little follow-up is done. So mo many of the companies of the Lava Jato case that committed themselves to Im implement uh, compliance programs, for example, are not imp imp implementing these programs, are now again on the business of corruption, oh. and there is no follow-up from the authority in this case. Well, that's crazy. I'm, uh, thank you, Jose, uh, super clear and very um, powerful suggestions. I, 
I'm, what I'm going to try to do is make sure everyone gets two minutes, and then I want to give the last word to Jason on, because you're coming at it from a very different angle, which is that of the investigative journalist. And I really think it's very important to understand how to create a stronger echo, uh, ecosystem for investigative journalists in the United States on this front. So we'll go to David and then Merchi and then. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Zoe. Again, you know, I, I started uh, my presentation um, applauding um, Jason um, and really the need to support investigative journalists, um, the need to support more evidence-based research at track, you know, we've undertaken a project of, of the hubs of the of, of illicit trade, looking at the convergence, at the interconnections between corruption, money laundering, and various, an array of um, illicit trafficking and smuggling crimes. Um, because if we are able to show law enforcement communities, when we talk about coordination, about cooperation, on leveraging, on leveraging authorities, resources, intelligence to target, to surface, to target, to disrupt, dismantle. I think we could be doing a lot more um, as an international co uh, community. And I think it is important um, to really support these public-private partnerships as well. Um, the business community um, has a lot of intelligence as well that can help law enforcement to identify um, some of these uh, threats. And, and, and just finally, look, I mean, this is really hard. This is hard work, um, and I think the State Department and the U.S. government needs to be having more honest and difficult conversations uh, with complicit governments, whether it's in Paraguay, whether it's in, in, in Panama, whether it's in Belize, whether it's in Mexico. You, we are seeing more of the complicity between kleptocrats and criminals, including in laundering um, their proceeds. Uh, recent DEA, FBI, the Cullen Commission in Canada has highlighted uh, the complicity of, 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 of these kleptocrats, organized criminals, and in some cases, terrorist groups like Hezbollah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Merci. Um, uh, I have had two problems, only two. <laughs> The overcompliance is a big problem for the ordinary Venezuelan people. Can you but say what overcompliance is? Global, not for the corruption, uh, because he, they um, launder a million and billion dollars uh, all years. But the Venezuelan people don't, don't have a, a transfer for one thousand. It's a big problem for us. Um, we, we need a change in, in, in the process because the corruptor have uh, Achilles. Achilles? Achilles. Achilles. Innovadores. But the ah, system... Okay. You're saying that corrupt actors are agile and innovative. But the system is rigid. The system is slow and rigid. Don't change, not, don't adapt to the new process. And uh, this is a, a, a very issue. Um, the, other, the other issue is uh, the case of grand corruption are multi-countries. Multi and we need an uh, investigation to multi-countries investigation. And we need uh, a, a work together to, uh, between a turner. It's not enough uh, the cooperation uh, in, in between a turner, a turner fiscal, right? Attorney. Attorney. Uh, we need more. Only cooperation is enough, it's not enough. We need a group, a trabajo conjunto de fiscalías por caso. So joint investigations across country around uh, unique cases. That was great. Um, I want to give Jason um, a few minutes to speak and then open it up to any questions that others have. 
before I talk about the journalism, I want to bring up a potential policy change or that, that I think is in, shown in, these, in the Father Money series. Um, you know, I, I sort of belabored the point that these were being done by local jurisdictions. Um, said he's talking about Venezuela that's being handled by Maine Justice, it's being handled by the Southern District of Florida. It's, in a sense, a foreign policy um, mm -hmm. maneuver by the United States government. Um, but empowering these, these regional offices that haven't historically done um, these complex money laundering cases, these foreign kleptocracy cases, is a potential way to, to, to head off the problem, have more resources on it, um, not waiting for the money laundering and asset recovery um, prosecutors from D.C. to come in, but actually letting the training and um, empowering the local U.S. attorney's offices to take on these cases, like when you have, you know, Ukrainian oligarchs buying um, real estate in Ohio. Um, th there's, I think, an opportunity there to, to deal with this at a, at a more regional level. But um, to plug the journalism, um, you know, this story took a lot of support from a lot of different entities. Uh, I got money from the um, International Center for Journalists and the Border Center for Journalists and Bloggers to travel. Um, uh, type investigations supported with uh, legal review and with editing and with fact checking. Um, the freelance investigative reporters and editors newsroom supported one of the pieces. Um, and a corruption data collective provided data analysis, which was a pretty big deal for me. Um, you know, I, in some newsrooms, I've been able to work with a data reporter. I didn't have that on this on this project, and so um, they did some stuff that really allowed made, made reporting this a lot easier. Um, another area um, of support that I think we could use is like actual litigation support. Um, there are any number of documents in this that remain sealed. Um, and having somebody who could go to court and make motions to unseal on 10-year-old cases would be, I think, could yield some really, really fascinating information. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking about ways that to support investigative journalism, you know, money goes a long way. Um, but there are other, you know, the, the data analysis was really important um, in there. I think there are other ways to, to do that. Um, and, and I will say, just because ICFJ and the Border Center um, uh, supported this project, that then we're talking about you know, international collaboration. I know that, that ICIJ um, is part of uh, the Anti-Corruption Data Collective. There's really a lot of opportunity to support that work as well, to have journalists in multiple countries working on these stories. Um, the court records I obtained through these stories ended up going to some journalists in Mexico, one mm. of the people who the U.S. abandoned their prosecution of, got um, contracts to build COVID hospitals in 2020, and so some regional reporters in the city of Coahuila were able to use uh, records I'd collected through this to, um, to write about those contracts and the allegations that the U.S. was making against this person. So um, th there's, there's a lot of opportunity for that as well. Thank you. I want to open it up to questions. Yes, Ian Gary. Sure. Uh, in, in the case I mentioned here, the Ferrari case, for example, there was predicate offenses related to drug trafficking, to illegal mining, to contraband, and none of those were tied to the money laundering issue. So uh, Ferrari was uh, tried in Peru for these predicate crimes, but the money laundering problem and the money laundering crime that was the essence of the case was not tried in Peru. It was uh, here in the United States that an investigation was started. And that happened because agencies were not talking to each other. The prosecutors, specialized prosecutors in contraband, in drug trafficking, were not talking to the customs and uh, to the specialists in money laundering schemes. David, you wanted to add Yeah, that? only to the extent that, um, you know, with respect to predicate, uh, predicate crimes and the how, how does an agency leverage more of some of the some of the intelligence evidence that it's not used for specific cases? For example, 
if DEA has successfully um, investigated a narco-trafficking case, but they come across other evidence and data related to human trafficking, wildlife trafficking, you know, uh, other crimes, are other parts of the U.S. government leveraging, you know, that data to be able to do other investigations that can help to, to counter human trafficking, counterfeiting, and, and, and other crimes? The answer is not enough. I can tell you it's not enough because I have talked uh, within uh, the U.S. Uh, law enforcement community. So I think we need to find a way to share that information more, mm -hmm. to do more of, of, of the prosecutions and the other crimes. Thank you. Yes, sir, the gentleman in the, over, thank you. <laughs> if you could just say your name and, and who you're with. Hi there, I hope you can hear me. Uh, my name's Jonathan Lyles, I represent uh, Her Majesty's, uh, no, I should say His Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs in the United Kingdom. Um, in Europe, um, it's probably well known to my European peers here that uh, we have a, a significant issue with cigarette smuggling. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, certainly when, from the US angle, is, is potentially some of these um, logistics route supply chains used for traditional drugs importations into the United States being used for outward flows of um, illicit cigarettes, predominantly from the Chinese region and others, um, for, for means of payments for, 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 the, for said drugs uh, as a form of trade-based money laundering. Appreciate with customs authorities, myself being a customs officer of old, um, you know, the priority is, uh, is the inwards flows of uh, contraband and, and illicit products. And I just wonder, maybe for, for David or Jose, what, uh, you know, what measures are being adopted by HSI, CBP and others um, to sort of concentrate um, efforts, efforts uh, of um, those export products, which may not necessarily be a direct, uh, you know, necessity for, for US uh, authorities, but perhaps are being, uh, these legitimate products are, are being used for illegitimate it, you know, non-legitimate reasons for, for, for uh, means of payment. And uh, I hope that makes sense, and uh, I'll pass it over. Well, uh, well first of all, uh, thank you, for, uh, uh, HMRC. I mean, I think you guys are one of the global leaders on fighting uh, many um, illicit um, um, contraband, um, illicit trade products. With respect to the illegal um, cigarettes, uh, you know, I think it is a, a fantastic question, right? I mean, we are, there's been cases actually that have been um, investigated in Texas and McAllen specifically, and where you had Losetas and you had the Jalisco cartel um, working by, by directionally smuggling um, cigarettes, some, sometimes from the U.S. to Mexico and sometimes the other way around. Um, if you look at the Chinese CCP, the, the big tobacco company, and, uh, th they control, I think, more than 50% of the global market. And they are very active on leveraging these hubs of illicit trade, these freight, free trade zones that I've been talking about. And again, um, you know, through different investigations in the UK and the US, th there is more um, information that is coming out on the complicity as well of, 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 of corrupt officials. And again, I think it's, it's important to, to get other jurisdictions across um, you know, the international community um, to be working to do more disruptions at some of the um, other free trade zones or hubs of illicit trade. I, I don't know if I answer your question specifically, and, but you know, I think there's a lot of intel for other jurisdictions to join HMRC and HSI and others to do more uh, disruptions. We can take one more question. Yes. All right, we're taking two more questions. I promise we'll wrap up in five minutes or less. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, good evening. Sophie Flossat from the German Development Corporation. Thank you very much for all the presentations. I have was one question which was addressed by several of the speakers and mainly going into banks or companies being involved. So as you had highlighted, even if some companies or banks are being targeted, it's mostly just fines and then the people actually being involved, you know, they, they are fine, they don't go to prison. So linking to the title of the session, so without changing any laws, 
are there actually tools or procedures which would allow us to, you know, help people accountable um, at those higher levels? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, you, there were, I, one of the people I interviewed for one of the stories was like a former um, Justice Department um, official who was originally from New York and he went on a foul mouth tirade about how just um, indicting a few bankers would deal with the problem. Mm. Um, but that's, you know, easier said than done for a lot of reasons. Um, th there are, yeah, th th I think when you look through some of the records in that particular case study, there are questions about whether people within the banks were culpable. Um, and I just, that's kind of a, uh, for whatever reason, that's something that the Justice Department has a really hard time doing when they're getting away from, I, mean, mm -hmm. I think even talking about, when you're talking about the cigarette smuggling and outbound contraband, getting out of, particularly when, you, when you're on the ground, talking to like line agents and line prosecutors, getting out of the framework of how they do investigations and bring, looking at targets who aren't traditional targets for, for indictment. I think that they really, they struggle sometimes to, to get the supervisors on board with that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot, you, you start reaching into politicians' pockets when you do things like that, and there's a lot of, of discomfort. There's also, I think, sort of legitimate concerns about like, are we indicting John Q. Public now because they happen to be involved in a financial transaction, um, but but there is a lot of resistance. Um, yeah, in, in, at, 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 on the among the line agents and among the line prosecutors to doing that, that some of these things, and sometimes they just don't know about the statutes. I had a prosecutor tell me that an agent just brought him a statute, and he oh I hadn't seen that since law school, um, you know, <laughs> and he looked it up, and and they were able to do an indictment on it. Um, so I, and, and one of the uh, one of the agents I quoted in the story, she said, you know, the average agent wants to go around and bop people on the head. They want to arrest a drug trafficker and roll them over and, and, and work their way as far as they can go until their bosses get bored and tell them to indict. Um, and, and I think that to both of those questions, it's sort of a struggle to get people to think about it a different way. Uh, the lack of adequate sanctions for the powerful uh, companies or individuals is not because of lack of laws or legal infrastructure. It's because of political or institutional will to enforce those laws. Uh, something of that started to break in the Lava Jato case, for example, in Latin America, basically I would say in Brazil and in Peru, were very powerful companies and the owners of those companies went to prison. In the case of my country, the last six presidents have been investigated and gone to prison, and some, well, Fujimori is still in prison, convicted to 25 years. So, but this is a matter about impunity. And uh, that's, that's a major issue, because usually the criminal system is not enough to provide the, 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 the institutional will to make this work equally for everybody. Uh, in the plenary, uh, I think the representative of AID was talking about Yanukovych. We made a campaign in TI some years ago that was called Unmask the Corrupt to show the world what was happening with the powerful actors of corruption. Yanukovych never went to prison. He's hidden in, in, in Russia, protected by Putin, and uh, all the evidence of his crimes is there. So I think it's, it's a matter of enforcement and institutional will in order to change that environment. And I want to sort of close with, I mean, the, the real challenge is that big money and dirty money all benefit from the same mechanism. So as Merchie was pointing, I mean, as uh, Lakshmi was pointing out, you know, there's a lot of uh, in the black box that is private equity that is uh, unknown to us, yet we do know through the FBI leak that that is a major target for money laundering. And yet it is very, very hard to um, try to even enforce rules that would technically uh, make um, greater, uh, you know, require the private investment funds to really uh, do any real customer due diligence. And so um, I think that's really our challenge. And I think one thing I'm seeing that the civil society and the investigative journals can do more in, in consonance with each other is, is really doing that work like the work of the Texas Observer in regional papers where you can draw out some of some of those linkages more clearly, the convergences 
I think we have to do much more advocacy around those connections. And, and I think sometimes our focus on the national security risk loses sight of the bigger picture. Um, and that's an area for potential exploration in terms of how the advocacy groups sort of tick away from just a full throttle focus on national security and really thinking through the way in which global capital and international corruption flows sometimes go hand in hand, which is not, please don't call me a Marxist, I am not. Um, I'd like to ask uh, David to maybe have a closing remark here because you've talked about involving the private sector. So where have you seen it work? Because I can tell you private equity firms do not want greater transparency in who their investors are. Well, a place where it is working very effectively is here in the US. Um, you know, For example, in counterfeiting, uh, where the private sector um, works. Well, a place where it is working very effectively is here in the US. Um, you know, for example, in counterfeiting, uh, where the private sector um, works very well with the U.S. IPR Center. And, mm -hmm. um, to, What's the IPR Center? Uh, the Intellectual Property Rights mm -hmm. uh, Coordination Center and, um, that is um, uh, spearheaded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And so they do have one of these public-private partnerships where they do um, have consultative meetings, um, whether it's the IPR center or other fusion centers, um, businesses um, across different industries can provide intelligence to uh, US law enforcement that may help them to disrupt and dismantle um, various illicit networks um, across different crimes. Thank you. I'm gonna have to wrap it up because it's Way past 6.30, I really want to thank you. I just will say that um, the Anti-Corruption da Data Collective isn't just doing their uh, homework and producing the rapporteur report they make us do, but we are going to do uh, a briefing on this, uh, which will be uh, reviewed and validated by the presenters today to make sure that we really get these sort of recommendations written up and, and use them as guideposts for some of the advocacy that we do and we support. So really, a round of applause for these fabulous uh, presenters and many thanks.